All right, here we go. Our first big day with definite integrals. Uh, we've certainly flirted with them recently, and, and, and speaking of that, you know, let's recap what we've done so far. So far, we, we spent uh, the first two days just approximating um, a definite integral's value. Um, and of course, anytime you use the word approximating, if you like to use the word estimate a little bit better, go ahead and use that. And we estimated or approximated those by using Riemann sums, uh, those crazy looking rectangles and we also used some trapezoids and such and, and we looked at ones that were pretty good estimates but they're certainly not exact and then we did get some exact answers um, geometrically and so but the, the thing there we were kind of at the mercy of the function it had to be a very well behaved function it created a geometric shape like a you know a square or a rectangle or a, some kind of semicircle or trapezoid so but we did get exact answers though that was the benefit but we have not done what? We have not been able to evaluate these guys analytically um, or, you know, sometimes we call it algebraically. We haven't been able to do them by hand. And this, once we learn the first fundamental theorem and how to do these by hand, we'll be prepared to handle any definite integral they try to throw at us. Every time we talk about a definite integral, I want you to continue to visualize this image right here. I think this picture does a great job of kind of showcasing what it's all about. But anyway, let's go ahead and get our formal definition in here. A definite integral is the area of a region. That's how we want to continue to think of it. You know, back in the day when we talked about derivatives, we kept cramming, you know, slope, 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 rate of change, rate of change, rate of change. And now with it, when we start talking about definite integrals, it's all about area. Now, so our formal definition says if... Um, if f is continuous, okay, good. Um, if it's non-negative, when we'll actually deal with the negative later on, that's not really too big of a word. On the closed interval from a to b, then the area, again, our magic word area, of the region bounded by the graph of f of x, okay, which in our picture is this nice blue curve here. Um, the x-axis, that's always implied. That's a, by default, the x-axis is always going to be one of our boundaries. And the vertical lines, x equals a, right here, and x equals b, right here, then the area is given by the integral from a to b, got those bounds on there, and then our function with respect to x. So now it's time, and I'm very excited to introduce you to the first fundamental theorem of calculus. And as the name suggests, this is a big, big deal. But basically, what you need to know is that when we talk about the first fundamental theorem, all it is, is it's a method that we use for evaluating a definite integral, okay? Um, specifically, you know, evaluating it algebraically. So here we go. Let capital F of X, that's a big F, be the antiderivative of little f of X. Okay, so big F's the antiderivative. So just for, um, if it was an indefinite integral, if I integrated little f, I would get capital F plus C as an indefinite integral. But how does that apply to a definite? So here we go. It says, and I'll try to write this as neat as I can because it's a big deal. If we have a definite integral from A to B of little f with respect to x, that is equivalent to the antiderivative evaluated at the upper bound minus the antiderivative evaluated at the lower bound. And that's it, ladies and gentlemen, and that's what we need to highlight in our notes tonight. Basi basically, if we want to make a checklist of what we're going to do, is number one, we're just going to integrate the function or find his antiderivative. Okay, piece of cake, right? And then what we're going to do is then we're going to substitute the upper bound. Okay, UB, upper bound. Make sure you go upper bound first, and then we're going to substitute the lower bound. And then we're just going to find, uh, you know, we're going to subtract or find the difference between those two values. And whatever that answer is, we're going to get some kind of number, and that finite number is going to represent the exact area of whatever bizarre region is created by these functions. So here we go. It's finally time to dive into, the, into one. This is, a, you know, kind of a momentous moment right here. This is going to be the first definite integral we've evaluated by hand. And our function is 4x minus x squared, and the bounds are from 0 to 4x. And just so we can appreciate what's going on here, if I tried to graph that function, 4x minus x squared, uh, I would have roots of 0 and 4, and uh, because of the negative in front of the x squared, it's going to open down. And so here's what my function looks like. That's f of x equals 
four x minus x squared, try to squeeze it in. And this integral is, um, we're starting at zero and ending at four coincidentally. So we're finding all of the area bounded between the curve and the x-axis just like that. So step number one, let's find the antiderivative. And I integrate this one term at a time, I'm gonna get two x squared minus one third x cubed. All right, now, as far as notation goes, we put this long line at the end to signify we're still gotta evaluate it at bounds of zero and four. Step number one, plug or substitute the upper bound in. So we've got two times four squared minus one third four cubed, okay? Now just to organize my work here, I'm gonna put that in big brackets, I'm gonna subtract, and now I'm gonna start plugging in the lower bound. We're gonna find out that zero is one of our best friends. It's a good reason to kind of excel or uh, celebrate and get excited when you see a zero coming because it's gonna be so much easier to plug in. And as we do some number crunching here, I'm going to get, let's see, 16 times 2 is 32 minus 64 thirds minus a whole lot of zeros. Um, just be careful. This, this minus sign is going to be a bear sometimes. We're going to have to really make sure we distribute that at times here tonight. But tonight we got away with it. Now, if I wrote in terms of a common denominator, we'd get 96 thirds. And so 96 minus 64, how about 32 thirds? And that is the exact area of this finite region up here. All right, we're just going to do another one. It's pretty straightforward just to get the really good practice underneath our belt. Um, I don't expect that this one's going to be any trickier. Um, in fact, the numbers might be a whisker friendlier. Um, so again, try to visualize this function. It's a parabola. It opens up. It's got a y-intercept of positive 2. And because of the three, it's going to be a pretty tight parabola that grows rather quickly. And the bounds go from negative 1 to positive 2. And so the area that we're referring to, again, visualize the vertical lines. And we're referring to all of this area underneath the curve and above, bounded by the x-axis in those vertical lines. So we're going to go get uh, an exact measurement for that area. That always kind of blows my mind away that we can find the exact measurement. Integrate these one term at a time. We're going to get x cubed plus 2x. Look at those friendly antiderivatives. And notation-wise, we've got our long evaluation stem and our bounds. We're going to substitute the 2 and get 2 cubed plus. And, of course, you guys can go faster than this when you go to evaluate your own tonight. I'm just trying to emphasize the substitution. All right, so we've had some really good practice with uh, using that first fundamental theorem to evaluate a definite integral algebraically. And I just want to introduce you to two really special definite integrals right now. Um, integral number one says, okay, what if I'm integrating this function? And, you know, the lower bound is some number a, and the upper bound is the exact same number. You know, maybe we're integrating from 2 to 2, or integrating from 5 to 5. You know, how much area am I actually measuring if the bounds, if the upper and the lower bound are the same? Well, hopefully you can visualize this and, and convince yourself that the answer is guaranteed to be 0. Because, in other words, well, we've got, you know, some function... But I've got a bound here and a bound right there, and I haven't created any space. So those two bounds have to be you know, separated somehow to create an actual area. All right, number two is if the bounds are from B to A. In, in other words, I again, we're, we're visualizing the closed interval from A to B, where A is the smaller number and B is the bigger. But what if they gave me an integral where the lower bound was the bigger number? I am allowed to switch the bounds with one special stipulation. And that stipulation is that I have to negate my final answer. So you are allowed to switch the bounds, just remember to negate. Okay, just to clarify those two rules we just saw, what if I wanted to integrate the sine function and I wanted to go from pi to pi? You know, instantly you wouldn't have to do, you wouldn't even have to lift your pencil off the paper. You'd instantly just say, hey, zero is my answer, just because the bounds are congruent or equivalent. And, or what if I wanted to integrate the sine function and they wanted me to go from 2 pi to pi? The first thing I would do is I would switch my bounds so that the lower bound was the smaller of the two numbers, but I would also have to negate. That is not an option, that is, that is mandatory. Anytime you switch the bounds, we have to negate. All right, our next special property is, again, it involves a lot of common sense. I don't think this is going to blow you away. Let's just assume that um, A is smaller than C, which is smaller than B, and we have an integral from A to B measuring all of that area. You're allowed to break that into two smaller pieces and say it's the integral from A to C 
you know, assuming that C is some number in between, you know, maybe A was a 2, B was a 6, and maybe C was a 3, you know, just hypothetically. And that would be uh, plus the integral from C to B of F of X dx. And I think that's, you know, fairly easy to visualize. Um, if we had some crazy function f, you know, maybe there's a, there's c, and over here's b, you know, all the area from a to c, plus all the area from c here to b here, you know, if I added region a and region b together, the, the sum would be equal to the integral from a to b. Okay, so we're going to practice a live example here, and there was two things given to us at the beginning of this problem. Uh, you know, we don't know who f of x is. It's some mystery unknown function, uh, but they have told us, they have given us two incredible clues. They said uh, the definite integral from negative 2 to positive 2 yields an answer of 0. In other words, the net area is 0. However, the integral from 0 to 2 gives us a, a net area of 6. So we're going to kind of work off of those clues and answer these following questions. The first one they've got for us is, hey, what's the integral from negative 2 to 0 of f of x? Now, in order to answer this question, agree on this. The integral from 0, um, let's see, let's scratch that. The integral from negative 2 to 0 plus the integral from 0 to 2 has to equal what? has to equal the overall big integral from negative 2 to 2 according to that additive property that we just talked about. So if you substituted the values we already had, we know that something plus 6 has to equal 0. So I think negative 6 is our missing quantity right there. So our unknown integral has to equal negative 6. Uh, part B, what if they wanted to know the integral from 0 to 2 minus the integral from negative 2 to 0. Alright, so we'll just take advantage of everything we already know. We already know that 0 to 2, uh, let's see, we already know that this guy right here is equal to 6 minus, and we know that this guy right here is equal to negative 6, so I got a final answer of 12. Alright, we'll switch up the colors here really quick, move the screen up a bit. Okay, alright, we're cooking. Part C. Let's say they wanted to go from negative 2 to 2 4 times f of x. How would you handle the 4? Well, I'm going to just slide that 4 out and rewrite the integral as such, just like this. All right, And you already know that this integral right here has a value of 0, and so we've got 4 times a 0, which gives us 0 for our total answer. All right, let's do one more just to test our properties here. Yeah, I'll try to slide the screen up here a little bit. Part D. Got some watermelon combination going on here. Um, what if we wanted to do 0 to 2 6 times f of x? All right. Again, take advantage of the property that allows you to pull the coefficient out. All right. And uh, let's see here. And let's see, that would just be 6 times what? What was I already forgot? 0 to 2. Was that 6 itself up there in a given? Yep. Okay, so 0 to 2 is 6 itself, so our final answer would be 36. Now, the only bear trap, watch out, what if they said from 2 to 0, 6 f of x? You know, exact same problem, but the bounds were switched at the beginning. You're still allowed to pull the 6 out, but what I would do is I would negate it and switch the bounds from to make them 0 to 2. Notice as I'm pronouncing the integral or reading it out loud, I always pronounce the lower bound first. I always say, like, you know, integral from 0 to 2, you know, that's kind of an implied thing. And so my final answer this time would be negative 36 by the time we're all done. All right, I'm going to do my best to come up with a, um, I'm going to draw a pretty crazy looking graph here and I want you to hang tough and, and do the best you can. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start at zero, zero, and I'm going to draw a semicircle that has a radius of one. So it's going to go through one, one, and then finish at two, zero. And this is, I want you to assume that this is a perfect semicircle. And then from there, it's going to go, it's going to linear with a slope of 1. So it's going to go through 3, 1, and then 4, 2, just like that. Okay, it's going to be straight edged. Um, uh, going to the left of the origin, we're going to, again, have a, this time it's going to be a slope of negative 1 to start off with, and then a slope of positive 1. 
So it's going to be just like that, okay? And let's call this f of x. This picture right here is f of x. And I'm going to throw some integrals at you based off of that. Um, the first one I want to know is what's the integral from 0 to 2 of f of x? Now, basically what we're going to find out is um, every time the region's above the x-axis, we'll get a positive answer. And any time it's below the x-axis, we'll get a negative answer. Um, but uh, although we didn't, I didn't draw any stuff that was below the x-axis this time, but you'll definitely see that eventually. So again, we're just looking for that area. We're referring to as this um, half circle, the semicircle. So I'm thinking 1 half pi r squared. Uh, the radius is 1, so I'm just getting 1 half of pi for that integral. If I wanted uh, the integral from, let's say, from negative 2 to 0. Now I'm referring to, oops, got to get my little dx in there. I'm starting at negative 2, and I'm going all the way to 0 here. So I'm thinking, ooh, it's just a triangle. We got, well, let's don't need the equals again. So we got 1 half. We got a base of 2, a height of 2. So we've got a nice answer of 2. All right, on this third one, I'm going to get a little crazy here. I want to integrate from 4 to 2. All right, so there's a red flag right there. We know right away we're going to have to switch those bounds and negate our answer. And I want to do 2 times f of x plus 5. All right, so there's a lot going on here. The first thing I want us to do is I want us to just switch the bounds. Okay, so we're going from 2 to 4. We got to negate. Everything else stays the same for now. 2 times f of x plus 5. All right, and I'm going to slide down, but I'll come back up and we'll look at that graph when we need to. All right, so we're negating. But what I want to do is I want to express this because there's a sum in the middle. I want to express this as two separate integrals. I want to go from 2 to 4, pull out my coefficient of 2, and do my f of x plus the integral from 2 to 4 of 5. All right, and so I'm negating. I've got a 2, and then for this part of the integral, I'm just using my graph, okay? So let's go back up there, the integral from 2 to 4. Let's see, start at 2, go to 4. Looks like a triangle, 1 half base times height. i got a total area of 2. So I'm going to go down here. I'm going to say, okay, that integral, whoa, 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 don't go away. Okay, uh, this integral right here has an area of 2 plus. And now this one, I'm going to, this integral here, I'm going to do by hand. Looking at the graph is not going to help me. I'm going to say the antiderivative is 5x with, um, whoops, I just want to do bounds of 2 to 4. Again, I got this whole thing negated out front. So we've got our 4 plus, and now I've got to plug in my upper bound minus my lower bound. And let's see, 10. I'm getting negative 14 for my final answer for the value of that integral. So a lot of action going on there. We had to switch these bounds, so we negated. And then I used some properties where I pulled that 2 out front. You see it right here. We wrote it as the sum of two separate integrals rather than just one big one. And that's a technique. I want to see you break it into smaller, more manageable pieces so we don't get overwhelmed too quick, too early. So hope we were solid tonight. I hope you picked up a lot of new little things. And let's put it all together tomorrow. And let's really focus on being excellent, taking it to a very high level and really dominating this topic.